let's rate the syntax of Middle High German. Syntax is the area of linguistics that regulates the arrangement of words or constituents in a sentence. The task of linguistics is to analyze these rules and examine the hierarchical relationships in a sentence. Historical syntax describes syntactic change, in particular the changes to the rules on which it is based, the results of which is the re rearrangement of words and constituents in a sentence. These fundamental considerations already show a certain elective affinity between morphology and word formation on the one hand and syntax on the other. In both cases, it is a question of grammatical subsystems that regulate the arrangement of linguistic elements. In the case of morphology and word formation, it is about the rules for the arrangement of morphemes. In the case of syntax, it is about the arrangement of sentence constituents. Due to this structural similarity, it is not surprising that in any given language there are significant areas of overlap where the control range of morphology plays into the syntax and vice versa. Consequently, these points of overlap are gener generically referred to as morphosyntax. From a historical linguistics perspective, the interplay of morphology and syntax should be explicitly underscored. Last week we saw how certain lexical units developed into morphological units over the course of history. Syntactic expressions can change into morphological units just as regularly. Or, as Tami Givon once put it succinctly, today's morphology is yesterday's syntax. However, one of the best known examples from historical morphosyntax, uh, the history of the French future tense, shows that today's morphology can also be tomorrow's syntax. Language change can be repeated. Latin, as the predecessor of all Romance languages, expressed reference to the future morphologically by inserting B between stem and inflectional ending, like in cantabo I will sing, which consists of the stem canta, the future P element B, and the first person singular suffix or. In vulgar Latin, this morphological marking became dysfunctional due to phonetic unification processes, such as a syntagma of infinitive plus inflected auxiliary verb was then used to express the reference to the future. Cantare habeo. Further developments in French saw a merging of the finite and non-finite verb forms. Uh, from the former, only the inflectional ending et in de chantre remained. The synthetic future tense of French has for some time been faced with the competition of an analytical construction from the inflections of the auxiliary verb aller plus the infinitive je vais chanter. We will deal with such interactions in Middle High German morphology and syntax in the first part of today's lecture before going into some select examples of Middle High German sentence syntax. The morphosyntax of Middle High German is of particular interest when it comes to the expansion of the system of using periphrastic verb forms to express the tense. Basically, as we have indicated several times already, transition from a synthetic to analytical language structure can be observed in the history of the German language. What does that mean in concrete terms for the development of today's tense system, namely the present, past, perfect, pluperfect, and future one two tenses. The forms of the synthetic German tenses, i.e. the present and past tenses, are inherited. What about the analytically formed tenses, which are of course much more interesting in the context of the history of German morphosyntax? The analytical perfect formation essentially crystallizes during Old High German and, apart from some differences in nuance, by Middle High German it is already in the same state as the modern language. A periphrasis made up of an inflected auxiliary verb and past participle depicts an event that precedes a point of speech in the present, like in the example on the slide. Sigune asks Parsifal whether he has dealt with the mystery of the grail in the past in such a way that he knows it in the present, whereupon the addressee replies that he has in the past lost his happiness, which he has to make do without in the present. 
Wolfram uses the standard temporal reading of the perfect tense twice here. Wie steht's ü omben gral? Habt ihr geprüft noch Sinat? Oder wie es bewendet über Fahrt? Erst bracht Zermeide wohl geboren, da han ich Freude viel verloren. Occasionally, Middle High German perfect forms can also be understood as expressions of the future perfect, as the following passage from König Rote suggests. However, such usages are not only marginal, when interpreting them we must fundamentally be cautious as to whether there actually is or has ever been a tense from form in German that is equivalent to the Latin future perfect. The effect of a verbal act completed in the future can just as well be due to the perfectic semantics of Finden in the second example of, uh, on the slide. Is rota darunda? Denn haben wir schiere funden. Let's leave the category of tense aside for a moment and turn to voice and how it is realized in Middle High German. It must be said at the outset that German forms its passive analytically from the very beginning and not synthetically, like Latin or Gothic. The modern language forms of the periphrastic passive have existed since Old High German. Transitive verbs from the so-called eventive or dynamic, uh, sorry, transitive verbs form the so-called eventive or dynamic passive with the auxiliary verb werden, as in der Hirsch wird getroffen, and the stative passive with sein as the auxiliary, der Hirsch ist getroffen. Paraphrastic verb forms can also be formed from intransitive verbs with the auxiliary verb sein, but these are not understood as passive forms, rather as perfect forms. Der Mai ist gekommen, der Mut ist aufgegangen. In Middle High German, this clear connection between verb valency and the use of auxiliary verbs is already present, but not as consistently developed as in the contemporary language. Nevertheless, there are countless examples of perif periphrases with seen plus past participle, which can be understood as a stative passive in, as in the present language. Like the new High German successes, Middle High German besliesen and verliesen are transitive verbs whose participle, together with the auxiliary verb sein or seen, does not describe the process but the state or the result. The well-known Du bist mean, ich bin dean from the Tegernseer Briefsammlung does not deal with someone who is about to be imprisoned in the heart of the beloved, but with somebody already imprisoned there, and accordingly the loss of a key is not told, but stated as a fact. Du bist beslossen in meinem Herzen, verloren ist das Schlüsselin, du musst immer darinne sehen. The same applies to the eventive passive with werden plus past participle, which is also used on numerous occasions in Middle High German as in the Helmbrecht quote on the slide. Wird dir der Fuß abgeslagen, sie soll dir die Stelzen tragen zu dem Bette alle Morgen. Of particular interest for the language historian are cases where the equations intransitive plus b equates perfect or transitive plus b equates stative passive do not apply. Relatively common cases uh, common are cases like mehr ist noch viel selten geschenket besser wien from the Nibelungenlied. Middle High German schenken is clearly a transitive verb, but this is by no means a state of passive, rather an eventive passive. It is not uncommon for cases with a double reading to occur. The most famous in this context is certainly the beginning of the so-called program verse of the Nibelungen Lied, Uns ist in alten Meeren wunders viel gesagt. On the one hand, it is possible to read this as a stative passive. In all tales, unheard of things were told to us. The reading almost resembles the perfect with present relevance. Something has been said and is presently relevant to us today. 
More conventional is the view that this is an eventive passive with a wrong auxiliary verb, and an analogous to mir ist noch viel selten Geschenke besser Wien. The translation would then be in old tales unheard of things are told to us. In order to do analytical justice to the partial overlaps between the stative passive of transitive verbs and the perfect tense of intransitive verbs, it's a suggestion made by Elizabeth Lies around 30 years ago for contemporary New High German can be used. Uh, in her opinion, constructions as uh, New High German er ist gekommen and er ist getroffen are so broadly equivalent that they should be viewed as realizations of one and the same category, which Lies calls resultative, resultativo. For the Middle High German condition, conditions at least, this suggestion very much seems worth considering. Let us now turn to a tense whose periphrastic expression in Middle High German is considerably further away from the situation in contemporary language than in the cases considered so far. In this instance, we are talking about the future tense. In the Germanic verbal system, the present tense could be used to express the future. In Old English, Old Norse, Old Saxon and Old High German, future periphrases then develop with various modal auxiliary verbs denoting an obligation, an intention or a possibility. In Middle High German, this system is further expanded but is still very much in flux. In all, four periphrastic expressions compete. Number one, soll plus infinitive. This is the oldest periphrasis attested in Old High German and also in Early Middle High German. Unze der wird, ge unze der wird geboren, der all die Wertes koll nähren. Second alternative, Moors plus infinitive. Uh, this preserves the modal nuance even more than the sol periphrasis and is as such and as such is only rarely used in a purely futuristic way, like in the Walter document on the slide. Der je an anegänge was und muss an ende sieben. Third possibility, will plus infinitive. Volative use is dominant here, but clear future readings are also possible, like in Ihr wählt euch alle Fliesen, wählt ihr die Recken bestahn. From the Nibelungenlied. Uh, frequent variants uh, in the tradition testifies to increasing uncertainties in the use of individual modal future paraphrases. The early Nibelungenlied manuscript B contains the future reading of the Soll paraphrases. Ich soll u sagen mehr was u min lieber Herre Herr in Botten hat. In Nebelungenlied manuscript I, almost a hundred years younger, the form of Sullen is replaced by a form of Wellen in the same passage, the future reading of which is less compelling than the future reading of Soll in B. To explain, Soll in B could only be understood as modal if an instance could be determined from the context that would have expressly commissioned Rüdiger von Bechelaren to utter his dialogue. Such an authority is not mentioned. The Lord's request refers to the message, not to its utterance. For the scribe of I, Soll obviously no longer possessed the futurity nuance, which is why he replaced the form with will. So will ich sagen mehr, was u min lieber Herre Herr in Botten hat. It is no coincidence that the scribe of a late Middle High German manuscript either no longer understood a modal future periphrasis or rejected it as being too ambiguous, which is more likely. In the development of Middle High German, modal future periphrases faced increasing competition from the Vedan periphrases, the only remaining way to form the future in modern German. The origins of Vedan plus infinitive uh, are disputed. 
in Old High German it occurs very rarely, in Middle High German even more rarely than werden plus present participle. Like in Er wird uns kommende Balde zu Hause von dem Walde. Konrad von Würzburg, Trojan War. Therefore, it is usually assumed that the construction werden plus infinitive came from the construction werden plus present participle. There are several possible explanations for the emergence of the future periphrases. Phonetic reduction, participle ending, analogy with the modal periphrases soll, will plus infinitive, or interaction of reduction and analogy. Nevertheless, periphrases with an unambiguous future reading are still rare in Middle High German. Uh, the reason for this is that the periphrases werden plus present participle originally had an incoative meaning referring to the beginning of an action or a state as in uh, als is ward tagende. Gottfried, sie wurden spielende um begurt. Herker. As the evidence suggests, the incoative reading of werden plus present participle is increasingly restricted to cases where werden occurs in the preterite. The incoative nuance of the periphrases present tense of werden plus past pa present participle is lost. As the preterite construction in late Middle High German and early New High German gradually disappears, the conditions for an interpretation of the present tense construction became favorable. Accordingly, verbal complexes, complexes of werden plus infinitive with a clear future reading are still rare in Middle High German and consistently occur late. See some examples. So wird zur Hand ihr einer mit ü justieren auf dem Plan. Uh, uh, late 15th century manuscript of Conrad's Patonopie and Meliur. And a second example from the Ambrasa Heldenbuch, beginning of the 16th century. Was wir zwei klagen sollten, das wird ihr eine klagen. The definitive establishment of the construction present tense of werden plus past participle did not take place until the 16th century. In the history of German, future tense is a relatively recent phenomenon. This brief overview of Middle High German morphosyntax should be completed with a few observations on failed attempts at periphrastic constructions to express lexical aspect or Aktionsart. Aktionsart is a concept that refers to the internal temporal structure or other substantive aspects of verb meanings or sentence meanings. We have already spoken about the rise and fall of the periphrases preterite of werden plus present participle expressing an incoative actionsart. In addition, there is another periphrasis in Middle High German consisting of an auxiliary verb, this time sehen, and the present participle to express durative actionsart. Ob der Rieter herkommt und mir zu meiner Not gefrommt, mit dem der Lewe fahrend ist. In addition to the aforementioned combination of werden plus present participle, Middle High German also has the periphrases of beginnen plus infinitive gerund to express incoative actionsart. The reason for assuming a periphrastic verb form here cannot be the fact that beginnen occurs with the infinitive, after all, this is still the case in the present day language. However, it is obvious that Middle High German beginning appears in many contexts where it seems dispensable in modern High German, which is at least a strong indication of a grammatical, not purely lexical use. Some examples. Genelun gestunt in Almitin, die Forsten begonnt er bitten. Rulands Lied. Finally, the construction tuan plus infinitive occurs quite frequently in Middle High German, expressing an intensification of the action denoted by the infinitive. Eins tu nit vergessen. If none of the mentioned periphrases for the expression of Aktionsart was able to assert itself in the long run, this may have to do with the fact that Aktionsart never developed into a fully-fledged verbal category in German. 
and the model language, uh, with the exception of the so-called Rhenish durative gerund, er war am telefonieren, Aktionsart is hardly ever realized morphosyntactically. Uh, instead, it is mostly conveyed by means of word formation, for example, with the prefix ent in entflammen or with the compounding constituent bleiben in stehen bleiben. Syntax of simple and complex sentences. One characteristic of German syntax, which is extremely striking from a typological point of view, is the tendency to form verbal or sentential brackets. This is sometimes lamented with the argument that in German one always has to wait until the end of a sentence for crucial information. This peculiarity was by no means a in Old High German, uh, but it underwent a significant expansion over time. Middle High German represents a transitional state. There are three uh, different types of brackets. The nominal bracket consisting of determiner and noun, das relativ wenig erfreulich und zudem unerwartete Ergebnis. Second, the verbal bracket consisting of auxiliary and infinitive, das Kind ist in den Brunnen gefallen. And finally, the sentence bracket consisting of introductory element to the left and finite verb form to the right. Das Kind, das in den Brunnen gefallen ist. Although there are hints of the current system in Middle High German, bracket syntax between the 11th and 14th centuries does not appear to have been fully consolidated. We will first turn to verbal and sentence brackets in Middle High German and begin with the former, the state of development of which can be shown quite well on the basis of the introductory passages from Bertolt von Regensburg's sermon Das etliche Jehend, Tour, das Gurte und la, das Übele. In some cases, verbal brackets appear as we know them in modern German. The left bracket is the first, in the first example is the finite verb form wären in second position. The right bracket verloren closes the sentence. Und wären wann die aller unschuldigsten verloren. The right bracket does not always obey the same serialization rules as in the contemporary language. This particularity applies to verbal complexes with three or more parts such as New High German hätte kommen können or hätte gehen lassen. In Middle High German, the auxiliary verb precedes the main verb. Du sollt die Burse an mir us lassen gehen and not gehen lassen. The clearest evidence of a verbal bracket that has not yet been consolidated are those sentences where individual constituents of a sentence, often prepositional phrases, are placed to the right of the bracket, which means that the latter can only inadequately fulfill its function as a boundary marker of the sentence. Unde davon so sult ihr große Wiesheit merken, right bracket, which follows is an dem edlen da wieder. And the same in und also sult ihr uf das Ende warten with a prepositional uh, construction bit gurtem fließe. This statement about the Middle High German verbal bracket only applies if one assumes that the emphasis is syntactically and not stylistically conditioned. After all, there is also the possibility in contemporary language to focus on a constituent by placing it outside the bracket. Ich habe ihn nicht gesehen, deinen Wohnungsschlüssel, instead of ich habe deinen Wohnungsschlüssel nicht gesehen. With regards to sentence bracketing in Middle High German, the distinction between main and subordinate clauses is not always as clear as in modern German. The pronoun der in ich bin der die Sünde hat begangen allows for two readings. On the one hand as a demonstrative pronoun with the function of a predicative nominative supplement in the main clause, I am the one. On the other hand as a relative pronoun in the subordinate clause, who committed the sin. In most cases, however, only the relative reading is possible, which can be seen as an indication of the development of the sentence bracket in Middle High German. 
in Dien an der Sünde, du auch der fremden Sünde einü ist, du heiße die Sünde des Rates, there is a clear sentence bracket consisting of du and ist. All constituents of the subordinate clause are in brackets. The second du serves as a reinforcing resumption. One undeniable advantage of sentence brackets in terms of clarity is their capacity to be placed to the right of their matrix clause. In unde die ungetrüben Rat geben, die den Herren übelü ding geratend, gain armen lüten und gain riechen, the prepositional attribute gain armen lüten und gain riechen follows the right bracket ratend. Now to the nominal bracket. The bracket structure of the nominal group determiner plus x plus co characteristic of new high German is contrasted with a number of positional variants in middle high German, the most important of which is the so-called Saxon genitive. If its occurrence in the contemporary language is limited to proper nouns, Kriemhilds Rache, the informal name of the second part of the Nibelungen lead, or archisms minus Bruders Hüter, my brother's keeper. Constructions such as des Liebe Sünden are still omnipresent in Middle High German, even though the nominal bracket is also used with a suffix genitive attribute, like in das Abgründe der Helle. Ambiguous sequences such as der Sonnen schien provide a functional justification for the reduction of the proposed genitive attribute. These still allow two readings well into early New High German, namely as a noun group, der as determiner of Sonnen, the shining of the sun, or as a determinative compound, der as determiner of Schien, the sunshine until the latter reading prevails in late early New High German. A few words uh, on the genitive as a polyfunctional case in Middle High German. General, it can be observed that the syntactic polyfunctionality of the Middle High German genitive is reduced over time. In addition to the reorganization of the nominal group, this development primarily affects the genitive as a governing case, which is usually replaced by prepositional or accusative complements towards New High German. Ihr pflegen drie Könige, from the Nibelungenlied versus drei Könige pflegten sie. There is, of course, lexical change as well, and the meaning of New High German pflegen with accusative is restricted to to nurse somebody. In Middle High German, there are still around 260 verbs with genitive government, and a large number of these were in the basic vocabulary, such as pflegen, vergessen, among many others. In the present-day language, only 56 verbs governing a genitive complement remain, and as a rule, they belong to formal styles such as Gedenken, Ermangeln, or Harren, which is a clear indication of the further reduction to come in the future. Negation the most stri striking structural difference between Middle High German sentence negation and New High German standard language is its discontinuous expression, which is often referred to in everyday language as double negation. Unlike in formal logic, where two negations cancel each other out, the discontinuous expression of sentence negation is omnipresent in natural languages. English, I can't get no satisfaction. French, tu ne tuera point. In cases like Do der Seere Wunde des Swertes nicht entfand, Middle High German also knows discontinuous sentence negation and expresses it by combining a pro, an, or anclitic ne with a negator nicht, niemand, niemand, dechein. Middle High German tends towards a reduction in expression and represents a special case in that there is already a clear tendency towards simple negation as we know it from the modern language. The findings in Middle High German are also often falsified by the fact that evidence from rhymed verse is cited in which negative clitics are used by the editors against the 
uh, manuscriptal tradition and against the usage of Middle High German to generate alternate, alternating rhythm, regular sequence of stressed and uh, unstressed syllables. For example, stanza 925 of manuscript A of the Nibelungenlied appears in Karl Lachmann's edition with three discontinuous sentence negations. Du, der Seele, Wunde des Wertes, nicht en, fand, number one. Du, ne, het er, et er nicht, number two, mehrere wand des Schildes rand. Er zuckt ihn von dem Brunnen, du lief er hagenen an. Du, ne, kund ihm nicht, number three, entrinnen des König Gunteres Mann. A comparison with manuscript B, stanza 981, shows, however, that the passage in question occurs without any negative critics and the sentence negation, as in the modern language, is expressed by simple negators. Here, consistently, nicht. Du, der Seere Wunde des Wertes nicht fand, du hättet er nicht mehrere wann des Schildes rand. Er zog den von dem Brunnen, du lief er hagenen an, Du kunt ihm nicht entrinnen des König Gunteres Mann. However, this finding does not mean that this continuous sentence negation in Middle High German is an invention of the modern editors. In the course of the Middle High German period, however, their occurrence is increasingly restricted to certain syntactic contexts. By the beginning of the 13th century, the system had evidently already been broken down to such an extent that relevant expressions appeared in two cases in particular. Number one, uh, with certain verbs, preterite present as well as tuon, lasen or ruchen, and in context position when a negator and negative clitic follow one another directly. Both occurrence variants can be observed in stances 1738 and 1739 of manuscript A of the Nibelungenlied. In the preterite present turn, a discontinuous sentence negation occurs in so entar unsere Herren mit strierten Jemen wollbestan uh, in the uh, fourth verse. Additionally, in contact position, it occurs in und hat er gute Sinne, dass er sie nicht entuert. A distinction must be made between discontinuous sentence negation and cases that, as rare as they are, are often cited in older secondary literature, such as the passage Das um wir reis und um wir fahrt, nie, nie man nicht des innewart from Gottfried's uh, Tristan. Uh, so, no one ever knew anything about their ride. The absence of the clitic and the successive occurrence of the negators nie, local supplement niemann, subject and nichtes, genitive object, object, indicate that there is less a syntactical and more a stylistic method of emphasizing the negative content of the sentence. From a grammatical perspective, the evidence can be seen as anecdotal. Finally, Middle High German has several specific uses of negators, the most important of which is the so-called exceptive construction. These are dependent clauses in the subjunctive negated by the clitic n or n, which exclude or restrict the content of the preceding main clause. Den, uh, which means mean and leap, will ich verliesen, sine werde mean weep, I want to die if she doesn't become my wife. Like discontinuous sentence negation, the use of negators in the acceptive construction disappears with the dismantling of the negative clitics. Firstly, these are clarified by the element danne. This creates a discontinuous acceptive construction. In the meantime, uh, in the meantime, this is how Nibelungenlied a manuscript die first half of the 14th century reads sie en werde danne mean weep it's still the same uh, passage uh, like before with the omission of the clitic only danne remains to express the construction in addition to the subjunctive mood such as in nebelungen lied small b uh, from uh, the 13 uh, 1430s or 40s 
where the passage in question reads, dann sie wert, mein Weib. The acceptive construction remained in this form until the first half of the 20th century. Man hängt keinen Dieb, man hätte ihn denn, you don't hang a thief unless you catch him, but it has disappeared from today's language. Instead of a conclusion, an outlook. After eight weeks of dealing with the diachrony of the Middle High German Schreibsprachen as linguistic varieties and then with Middle High German phonology, graphemics, morphology and syntax from a more grammatical perspective, it would now be time for some sort of conclusion. However, I would like to refrain from that and focus on an aspect that has been mentioned from time to time but which deserves a consideration of its own albeit a sketchy one, namely the history of research into Middle High German, which currently sits at a turning point. The canonical knowledge of Middle High German grammar and lexis still comes from the 19th century. Worthy of mention are the Mittelhochdeutsche Grammatik founded by Hermann Paul in 1881 and currently available in the 25th edition, as well as the large Middle High German dictionaries that are introduced briefly in the word formation session. All of these venerable and useful handbooks are in the process of being replaced. Since 2009, two volumes of a four-volume Middle High German grammar based on entirely revised source material have been published. Same applies to Middle High German lexicography. Since 2000, 2006, a new Middle High German dictionary has been published, uh, which is also based on a newly developed text corpus. With this key word, text corpus, I would like to refer back to the first session of this lecture, where I addressed some of the methodological consequences of the fact that Middle High German is a corpus language. Here, two far-reaching changes have taken place in the last two decades that have less to do with the composition or re-evaluation of, of a Middle High German text corpus, Exceptions such as the rediscovery of the Austrian Bible translator confirm the rule, and more to do with access to the manuscript tradition. Since the early 2000s, thanks to the continuous image digitization of library and archives holdings, larger and larger parts of the Middle High German tradition have become accessible online to anyone interested without having to go through editions. Completely new perspectives arise here, especially for linguistic questions, which can often only be dealt with on the basis of the manuscript tradition. You just have to use them. Thank you very much.